this video, we're going to take a look at how we use cognition to make decisions and judgments and some of the tendencies that follow, some good and some bad. We have several objectives for this video, and at the end of the video you should be able to answer these questions or objectives fairly well. Objective number one, describe drawbacks and advantages of overconfidence in your decision making. Next, be able to describe how others can use framing or wording in a question to elicit from us the answers that they want. Next, explain how pre-existing beliefs can distort our logical reasoning. Also, describe a remedy for belief perseverance. How can we fix that phenomenon? And lastly, Describe how smart thinkers react to using intuition. Good luck. Using and misusing heuristics. Remember, heuristics are kind of a shortcut, a cognitive shortcut to problem solving. And there's really two kinds that have been identified by cognitive psychologists. Those are representative heuristics and availability heuristics. Let's take a look at representative heuristics first. Let's suppose if you were to meet a man who is described as slim, short, wears glasses, and likes to read poetry, what would his profession most likely be? An Ivy League professor or a truck driver? How about if we met a student and found out that that student was from Middleton High School or Sun Prairie High School, and that's all we knew about that person. What would we think about them? Well, the first riddle, the probability that the person is a truck driver, is far greater than an Ivy League professor, because there are hundreds of thousands more truck drivers than there are Ivy League professors. Probability-wise, it's not even close. Basically, representative heuristics involve judging the likelihood of things and events in terms of how well they seem to represent or match our prototypes, and it may lead us to ignore other important information, such as statistics. Availability heuristics um, basically involve estimating the likelihood of events based on how quickly they come to our memory. For instance, um, if information comes very quickly to mind and we remember things very quickly because of their vividness or how recently things have happened, we, we presume those events are, are easily expected or very common. So whatever increases the ease of recall in our memory um, increases the perceived availability of such information. What factors influence how information can be retrieved in our memory? really three factors. How recently we've heard about some event, well it happened yesterday so it's already pretty fresh in my memory. How distinctive it is, that's how unique it is. For example, seeing planes fly into the World Trade Center and you're trying to fly after 9-11. And how correct information is. If you've done something a million times before, you're likely to think that that solution will work again for you in the future. When we make decisions and form judgments, um, we, we do this hundreds of times a day without even really being aware of it. And most of those decisions are probably based on intuition, which means we don't use systematic reasoning. We just kind of had an intuitive idea that something would work for us. One of those examples of intuition when we are using cognition is the overconfidence tendency. Overconfidence is a tendency to be more confident in our judgments than correct and to overestimate the accuracy of our beliefs and judgments. We might do this when we're judging other people and think we can size somebody up in a few seconds. Intuitive heuristics, um, confirmation of beliefs, and a lack of explaining failures increases overconfidence. An example, if we worked at the stock market, one seller and one buyer may be extremely confident about their decisions on a stock when only one of them can really be right. Let's 
take a look at a couple of examples. Question number one. What percentage of accused felons plead insanity in court? Is it 1%, 5, 12, 18, or 25 percent? I'd like you to write this down, but just think to yourself what the answer is. Question number two, what percent of all accused felons are successfully acquitted because of the insanity plea? And third, what percentage of convictions for felony crimes are obtained through a trial in court rather than plea bargaining before court? I'll give you the answer to those a little bit later, but I do want to add a note here that all these thinking or all these cognitive tendencies from heuristics to framing and belief bias, mental set, and overconfidence have drawbacks in our ability to reason logically and accurately, but if they didn't have any cognitive value, people wouldn't rely on them so much. So they actually do work for us some of the time, but when it comes to really big problems, and if we're, on, if we're wanting to think very smartly, intuition doesn't work very well for us. Although intuition does work pretty well for us in managing the trials and tribulations of everyday life. Let's go on. Another term that we want to take a look at quick is exaggerated fear. And this is a big deal in our country today, especially in the media. As opposed to overconfidence, Exaggerated fear is our tendency to be afraid of things that aren't really likely to happen um, because of availability heuristic or representative heuristics, for example. We, we fear things we probably don't need to fear. 9-11 um, crashes led to a major decrease in air travel, for example, and an increase in automobile travel. Now, statistically, um, it's much safer to drive than fly, of course. Um, and what do you think the odds are of being injured in, or, or dying in a traffic accident versus a terrorist attack versus getting attacked by a shark in the ocean? Any ideas? Your odds of dying in an automobile accident are actually probably one in about uh, six to 7,000. The odds of being attacked by a shark while swimming in the ocean are about 1 in 25,000, I think. And the odds of you being injured or dying in a terrorist attack are probably about 1 in 100,000. So we don't hear politicians warning us about not driving to work or driving to school. But they sure do want us to think that it's, it's very dangerous out there and that at any given moment we could die of a terrorist attack. Framing decisions, um, how an issue or question is framed, or better yet, how a, how a question is worded, can significantly affect how we make decisions. Let's say you own a deli, nice Italian deli, and at that deli you have some ground beef or Italian sausage. What do you think the best way to market that beef or that Italian sausage to your customers would be? Would you advertise it as, hey, come and get some of my Italian sausage, get some of my ground beef, get some of the salami, because it's 10% fat? Or would you advertise that your sausage and salami and ground beef are actually 90% fat-free or 90% lean? I think we would all agree that advertising 90% lean or fat-free would be the best way to market something even though they're actually exactly the same thing. Another cognitive tendency that can cause us to not make good decisions, and this is going to be huge in the next few months um, with the elections coming up, is belief bias. Remember, bias is a tendency. So belief bias is a tendency for our pre-existing beliefs to distort our logical reasoning by making invalid conclusions. So we become inflexible. Can you use the concept of belief bias to explain partisanship in politics? Belief perseverance, and if you think here, to persevere means to stick to it. So belief perseverance basically means our, ten our tendency to cling 
to our initial concepts, even in the face of contradictory evidence. So when your belief is discredited, you still cling to your belief. We've probably experienced this when we argue with our parents or friends. They say something and you think, oh yeah, I never thought about that, but you still stick to your argument. That's belief perseverance. An example, once you, you see a political opponent as aggressive or incompetent, you're likely to interpret everything they do as signifying their incompetence or aggression. Basically, it's an inability to change your mind once it's made up, no matter what. And that's probably not good when we're trying to problem solve or work in groups or come up with solutions to problems. Can you think of a time when you've done this or you've seen this? A quick um, add-on to our thinking questions. There, there's a couple of different types of thinking I want to briefly mention. And one of those is convergent thinking. This is a type of thinking that enables somebody to come up with a one single correct answer. We do this a lot in school. Um, for example, who is the president? And what does two plus two equal are examples of convergent thinking? Because there's only one right answer and everybody should come up with the same answer. On the other hand, divergent thinking uh, is kind of the opposite. This is a type of reasoning that allows somebody to kind of free think and come up with a lot of different solutions to a problem. And all those solutions might be equally useful, maybe not equally useful, but there's a lot of different solutions to a, a significant problem. An example might be which way should we drive to Chicago if we're going there for the weekend. We all want to get to the same place, but there might be many different ways or routes that we could take to get there. So convergent thinking you're going to come up with one correct answer. Divergent thinking, um, you're really developing your thinking and your reasoning capabilities. Divergent thinking is what many businesses and professions are looking for in their up-and-coming employees currently. We don't really teach a lot of divergent thinking, but you can develop divergent thinking through practice and just looking for alternative solutions. Lastly, I want to end up um, with some comparisons. The perils and powers of intuition. On the left-hand side of this column, on the next two pages, are problems with intuition. How can our common sense get us into trouble? On the right side is some evidence that uh, intuition and common sense can actually help us in certain circumstances. So you'll have to stop the video here and take a look at this. And I also believe this is in your textbook, um, this chart in Unit 7B. Thanks. You should return to your objectives and see if you can answer those questions. Um, I will be asking some of those questions in class and we'll be discussing it in groups.